Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. I am the parent of a 20-year-old, severely autistic boy, Stephen. Stephen was first diagnosed at two and a half years of age. And like most parents of autistic children know, we have had our shares of up and ups and downs. But undeniably, the last four months or so have been the most difficult of his life and ours. Stephen has been away from us for over a year now. The only reason that we're doing this is to show other people what went on in our house. Welcome to our house. Hello, Sam. You've been a bit traumatised, buddy, haven't you? Nearly every room in the house we would try to hide at night time, but he would hear the thump, thump, thump as he came up into our room. He knows that we love him. We want him to come home and be like he was before. We had Tasha in 91, and then Stephen arrived in 94. Yeah, what's Stephen up to? First two years were wonderful, and he was doing brilliantly well. Stephen, say cheese. Cheese. He was always on the top percentile, and, and weight, and height, and meeting all his milestones. Pointing and, and very happy little boy. <laughs> Until of course then he got a virus when he was about two. <laughs> After that week where he was ill, we noticed things that he would start to walk up and down the corridor of our house and he would just be studying and looking at fine grains in the wood. And seemed to lose all eye contact with us. Tasha, smile. Cool. Stephen? Stephen? Through Plunkett, it was a special education person who came straight in assessing him. Very nice. When the idea was first put to us that our son may be autistic, it was devastating. <laughs> but at the same time, it provided some answers as to how this rather unusual behaviour, it, it, it had a label. Stephen is a loving boy. He really is. It's weird to say it, but I think he's very people-oriented. Watch him. The happy times were just every day living with him and the funny things that he would do or the little routines that he has and 
getting to understand them. We, we love them. We love them to bits. When Stephen's happy, we're all happy. Yeah, that's totally the things that gets me is like, I just have such a problem with this whole situation. Ooh, good boy. It just seems so unfair to me. Yeah. Because he's such a good person and he just doesn't deserve that. He got very ritualistic and we had a few problems. Huge amounts of anxiety. His life had to be in order and it had to be regimented, which I think helps to reduce that anxiety. I think Stephen changed. He found it more and more difficult to try and alleviate the stresses that he was feeling. He would bang a wall, which really wasn't like Stephen. He wasn't aggressive, he wasn't... Then he would start to hit his own head when he got so frustrated. And it was like him telling us that, I can't handle this. By this stage, the house was a bit of a shambles, um, but his own safety, you know, is he was just really smacking his head really hard, which was, I mean, to hell with the house, you know, he can break walls, but I was scared he was gonna break his head. And then he started um, turning it on us. I hate to use the word attack, but he would, just come to us and grab Janine or myself and would pull on our hair and push very hard. It was, it was horrific. Because we'd always managed to cope. That last week in which we felt that Stephen and ourselves had really kind of lost the plot, we just felt that there was nothing more that we could do. It was a night where I, I had actually rung the crisis team, or the mental health um, team, and um, said, you know, that he was he was on medication and that he had autism. And I was told, um, we can't help you. We don't do autism. And I was just, I didn't know what to do. We went to Waitakere Hospital. We spent 24 hours in the emergency department. Um, <laughs> Stephen was just so distraught that he was, we were in a room and he was smacking a concrete wall. By the time the 24 hours was up, there was blood all over the concrete wall from where he'd split all his hands. It was, it was horrible. And we got hold of the, the psychologist again, and it was her recommendation that he be committed at that stage. Well, we totally resisted that. There's no way that can happen. And we put him in a wheelchair and we took him home. I think that was the Tuesday night. On the Thursday night, um, he went absolutely berserk and came out here and he was just smashing the wall. There was no wall. Murray and I went outside because he was just rampaging. He was looking for us and he was gonna, you know, really look like he was gonna do some damage. He had just had it enough. So then he followed us outside and this is like 11 o'clock at night and he is just like, yelling and he's smacking his palms on the pavers outside around the pool, you know, and smack anything, any sort of surface, he's like smacking. He's just so angry and just so, you know, I've never, ever seen, not only Stephen, I've never seen anybody that distraught. In the morning, I rang the psychiatrist and I said, okay, you win. We can't do this anymore. This is it. 
Um, and I'd just had my diagnosis the day before, of course, of breast cancer. Um, my whole family was falling apart. Everything was falling apart. It was just a big mess. So, <laughs> so I didn't tell Steve it to start with. I packed him, a, packed him a bag. I wrote him a social story <laughs> to say that he was going to hospital and he was going to stay there for a few days and they, they were going to help make his head better. And um, I gave it, yeah, I made him his favourite dinner and he came out and he was eating his dinner and I gave him a lorazepam to calm him a little bit and then they all arrived. So it was like he was going on a little adventure. He was quite calm. Um, went to the bathroom, changed his clothes, brushed his teeth, and um, yeah, showed him his story. And then, um, then they went to take him out through the hallway, and, and then he just got quite agitated. So the police turned him around and put handcuffs on him, and put him in the police car and away. And what did you and Murray do then? That night? Oh, man. Those minutes after he'd left. That night, just hugged each other. It was like, this is, it just seemed so wrong, but there was nothing else we could do. We couldn't help him. Yeah. Sorry. It was a frightening situation. I'm just going to show you a little collection of his tapes, which he absolutely adored and collected all his life. For some reason, it gave him some sort of outs to just destroy stuff. This is Stephen, probably 10 months before he went to hospital showing his very gentle, caring side. So when Stephen went into the mental unit at Waitakere Hospital, we quickly realised that he was in a place where these were grown adults going through horrific things in their own lives to be in that unit. And our 20-year-old boy who has, you know, the mental capacity of a three or four-year-old is in with adults. We were told that they couldn't guarantee Stephen's safety in an adult mental health facility and I was distraught. I was going for surgery the next day. I was going for a mastectomy and they're busy telling me they can't, they can't care for him, they can't look after him. Well, I can't. So it was, um, it was pretty rough, yeah. So we had to get him out of that place. We needed to do whatever we, whatever we could. He was in there under the Mental Health Act. So we had lost our legal rights to remove him. That's when, you know, the battle started. I decided that if I did a short video and just briefly showed people, people that matter, that what we were going through 
at the time that someone might be able to help us. He was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. It breaks our heart to see him there. But after four police interventions, including one at the Sturgis Respite House, there is nowhere for him to go. That video had an impact. The right people did see it. And from an absolute desperate situation we were in, things started to happen. Wendy Duff is a great friend. She was the first mum of an autistic child that we ever met. She has huge involvement with Autism New Zealand and is an amazing advocate for all families. Our boys are pretty much the same age. They're pretty similar. So as they started to get into trouble with Stephen, I was there for them. I come every second Friday to pick up Elliot to take him home for the weekend. And I guess the worst thing that can happen is he's very impatient and wants to go now. I've also prepared um, a plan. My husband's at home in case today goes badly wrong because if he um, is uptight, he's likely to get hit out, it can be really dangerous, and I can't handle him by myself. <coughs> Hello. Hi. How are you? You good? You want a test for me? You want a test for me? Mm. Another one? Mm. One more? Mm. For 2010, we ended up in crises. For about three months, we were beaten, hit. For us, it was diabolical. Can I stay with mummy and daddy? We'll just get some of your clothes? Through that process of us being in crises, I realised how bad it can get. And I realised that the people that sit in the ivory towers have no idea. When you say to them, you know, I'm trying to support a family or we're trying to support ourselves, we've got a holes in our wall, they think, oh yes, somebody's just put their hand through the wall. Shall we go? Okay. Over the last year of working out there in the community and trying to help families, I've realised New Zealand's gone backwards. We thought we had it pretty hard when we were first diagnosed, but I've realised now that actually we had it far better back then. Our funding was easier to obtain than what it is now. It's really scary because what is going to happen in the future? There's going to be soon, I fear, another child killed by a parent or vice versa because there is some aggression going on within some of those families that I'm helping. There is also some parents, sadly the mums mostly, um, turning to mental health themselves. From that point on where we had to find somewhere for Stephen to go to get him out of the unit, I rang up from Hamilton to Dargaville and that's where the difficulty was. He didn't have anywhere to go. The one shining light was Spectrum. Right now, as with every Thursday, <laughs> always butterflies, <laughs> because I guess I only get to see that little snapshot of Steve now. I only get to see him the once a week. It's actually really important that I see him. Happy. The guys that look after him know that as well because I just think about him all week anyway. some cooking. Good man. Yep. Here you go. They're both really, really heavy. Okay, can you carry those in? Okay. Cool. That's Sean. Tough. This is 
Yes, driver's license. Yep. There you go. Good boy. Cool. That's Hunter. That's Hunter's driver's license. I got a picture of Hunter for your for your board, okay? Really, really important for Stephen to know who's coming into the house, so we use visuals all the time. And um, obviously, new people in the house. Also, um, the carers for the day, their photo goes up as well. It just decreases Stephen's anxiety if he knows who's coming into the house. My name's Celo. Basically, what Stephen says, he's come into the house, um, coming from the clinic. Um, he was a bit, bit edgy, but since then, he's progressed really well, blended in well in the house. All we try to do is get him used to this is his environment, this is his home. Savage Garden, that one's Bare Necessities. A lot of the Disney songs he likes. He knows every song that Robbie Williams has ever put out. There are just certain other songs from, yeah, different, different places that he's heard or whatever, and yeah, he, I don't like him listening to them at all. And it, um, Remind him of that they'll, they'll make him really happy or not. Savage Garden is like a bit of an anxious song for him, so he kind of portrays his mood through what he's asking to look at. Can I sit here too? Good. Okay. I wish that I had Duck Feet by Dr. Seuss. Okay. I think it would be very good to have them when I play. My mother would not like them. She would say, Can my floor. She would say, you take your duck feet and you take them out that door. Some girls on his bike. It's okay. Mm. Mm. It's all good. Boy in town can hit a fly so far away. Mm. 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 Do you want to finish the book? Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for a bit. Yeah? You feeling better now? Those sort of outbursts of behaviours are probably uh, probably once once a day, but it's not every day of the week, for example. So there are moments where he's like good, you saw, and then there are moments where he just sort of blows up. But it's only short. And then more than anything we sort of redirect his focus as you saw the mum try to do. You did so good, buddy. I am so proud of you. You did really, really good. Okay? Well done. Mwah. 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 Okay? And I'll see you next Thursday. Hey, what are we going to make next Thursday? Cupcakes. Cupcakes. All right, done. Okay. So 
we take Stephen out every day. He has a weekly program. We're going that way. And it's mainly places that are of interest to him. Steve, sorry. Come. There's a car coming. Good man. Hold up. We have like walks on the beach, every farm's a good one, give us the animals. And I've got a couple of turkeys there. Yeah, not the sheep. The skin going really well. Morning. He has three full-time carers because it is 24-7 care. They're fantastic guys. Really brilliant. And Stephen loves them and, and, and they love him too. So obviously the house looks a lot different than it did. We had a lot of help. He hasn't been back here for over a year. When he does come back for a visit, none of us wants that last scene to happen again. He could come in and he could start smashing walls. We want this to still be a safe place for him. Good job. Yeah, actually, you better get the, the bugs out because Stephen doesn't like bugs. He won't go in there. And it's taken us all time to accept how Stephen was then and actually see now that he is coming back to his old self. And for him to know that we've forgiven him straight in, checking everything out, checking our fridge out, going straight in to help himself, feeling very, very comfortable. This is still his home, but he has another home as well. Now, as he grows into adulthood, he, he's moving on to a, a, a new part of his life, really. Thank you. Thank you for everything. We're giving him wings so that he can fly. And we've got them as well now. <laughs> we were really lucky that things have turned out the way they have for our family. There are still a lot of families out there hurting, in crisis, who need help. And they could be your neighbours. <laughs> 